The Pacific Ocean doesn't raise its voice when it's about to become dangerous. It doesn't warn. It doesn't hesitate. It simply keeps moving. Along the West Coast this week, waves didn't just crash against beaches. They climbed seawalls. They crossed roads. They poured into parking lots in neighborhoods that have rarely, if ever, seen seawater. In Washington State, flooding arrived quietly, but fast. Streets filled. Storm drains failed. Rivers backed up as the ocean pushed inward. And offshore, long before the first road was submerged, the instruments were already flashing a warning. This was never about a single storm. It wasn't a freak wave. It was something far more dangerous. Stored energy arriving all at once. Right now, the Pacific is delivering long period swells. Waves spaced far apart, but carrying immense momentum. Each surge arrives with enough force to travel farther inland than most people expect. And when those waves collide with high tides, saturated ground, and already swollen rivers, the result isn't just rough surf. It's flooding that spreads laterally, quietly, and fast. From California to Washington, the coastline isn't being hit once. It's being tested repeatedly, with no recovery time between impacts. Washington's coast is where this threat has become most visible. Communities near river mouths and low-lying shorelines are seeing water push inland from both directions at once. Heavy rainfall swells rivers from the interior, while long-period waves and storm surge block their exit to the sea. The result is a bottleneck effect. Water rises rapidly, often faster than forecasts predict, filling streets, yards, and basements before evacuation feels urgent. In places like Grays Harbor and along parts of the Olympic Peninsula, flooding isn't dramatic. It's relentless. Roads become impassable. Emergency crews reroute traffic. Harbors restrict vessel movement as conditions at entrance bars turn hazardous. This isn't coastal erosion, it's coastal inundation. And it's being driven by physics, not coincidence. Offshore buoy data tells the deeper story. Sensors west of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California are recording dominant wave periods exceeding 18 seconds, in some cases approaching 20. That number matters more than wave height. A shorter period wave breaks quickly and loses energy near shore. A long period wave carries enormous stored power, pushing water far beyond the normal surf zone. These waves don't arrive randomly. They come in organized sets, long pauses, then sudden surges that overtop rocks, walls, and barriers people assumed were safe. This is why experienced beachgoers are getting caught off guard. This is why seawalls are being overtopped. This is why parking lots flood even when the ocean looks deceptively calm moments before. The danger lies in the pause, not the crash. What makes this event especially dangerous is where the energy came from. Days earlier, powerful winter storms tracked across vast stretches of the Pacific. Their winds blew steadily over thousands of miles of open water, a region known as Fetch. The longer and stronger the wind blows across uninterrupted ocean, the more energy it transfers into the sea. That energy doesn't disappear when the storm fades, it organizes. Chaotic surface chop evolves into long-distance swell, waves that can travel across entire ocean basins with minimal loss. By the time those swells reach the continental shelf, they are no longer disordered. They arrive as focused pulses, carrying the memory of storms that may now be thousands of miles away. As the seafloor rises near shore, that energy has nowhere to go but upward and forward. Waves slow, steepen, and surge inland. This process, known as run-up, explains why water is reaching places that have stayed dry for decades. It's why seawalls designed for older conditions are being overtopped. And it's why Washington's flooding this week isn't driven by rainfall alone. The ocean is amplifying everything. In river deltas and estuaries, the effect multiplies. Rivers swollen by heavy rain attempt to drain into the sea just as incoming waves and surge push inland. When the ocean wins that battle, water backs up rapidly. Flooding spreads sideways, not just toward the coast, but inland, through neighborhoods far from the beach. Emergency crews across Washington are responding to flooded roads, overwhelmed culverts, and compromised infrastructure. Some communities have been cut off temporarily as water overtakes access routes. Harbors have issued restrictions as long periods swell sneaks past breakwaters, rocking docks, and snapping mooring lines not designed for this kind of motion. 
Inside protected bays, the water doesn't calm. It oscillates. Boats strain against their lines. Floating docks rise and fall unpredictably. These are not conditions caused by wind at the shoreline. They are the delayed arrival of offshore energy. And the pattern isn't finished. Buoy data confirms that fresh storm energy is reinforcing the swell rather than allowing it to decay. Weather models show no meaningful pause between wave trains. The coast isn't getting a reset. It's absorbing hit after hit, each arriving before the last fades. This is where confusion spreads. Dramatic footage circulates online labeled as tsunamis or mysterious surges. But the science is clear. Tsunamis are triggered by sudden seafloor displacement and travel as long, low waves with periods measured in minutes. What's impacting the West Coast now is wind-driven, storm energy delivered with ruthless efficiency. There is no tsunami warning in effect. Deep Ocean D-A-R-T buoys remain quiet, but that does not make the threat smaller. Long-period surf kills people every year because it looks manageable, until it isn't, because it travels farther than expected, because it turns familiar coastlines into moving hazards, and because flooding doesn't require an earthquake when the ocean itself is doing the pushing. Washington's geography magnifies this risk. Narrow coastal plains, low elevation towns, and river mouths place communities directly in the path of rising water. As sea levels creep higher over time, the margin for error shrinks. What once required an extreme storm now happens during conditions that feel routine. This is not an anomaly, it's a preview. Climate data shows that stronger storms, longer fetch, and higher baseline sea levels are becoming more common. Each factor alone is manageable. Together, they compound risk. Longer period swells reach farther inland. Storm surge pushes higher. Drainage systems fail sooner. Flooding spreads faster. Forecast models continue to improve, but even the best systems struggle to capture the combined effects of wave period, tide timing, rainfall, and infrastructure limits. That's why flooding can outpace warnings. That's why people are caught off guard. And that's why curiosity near the shoreline becomes dangerous so quickly. Because the ocean doesn't need to break records to cause damage. It only needs to keep coming. Washington's flooding this week is an early signal, not an outlier. A sign of what happens when stored ocean energy meets land already under stress. With more Pacific storms lined up, the cycle isn't finished. The coastline is shifting, the waterline is moving, and the margin for error is shrinking. This isn't about fear, it's about physics. And physics doesn't negotiate. If you live near the coast, respect closures. Avoid flood-prone areas. Stay back from jetties, cliffs, and harbor entrances. These warnings are not guesses. They are responses to real-time measurements coming in every few minutes from instruments watching a sea that has not calmed. The Pacific is still delivering energy. The coast is still absorbing it. The question now isn't whether conditions are dangerous. It's how long this pattern will last, and how prepared coastal communities are for what comes next.